One day, Iceland decided to pour seawater into a volcano. For the first time, people tried this on February 6, 1973. And back then, they were pouring water into the volcano at a rate of 26 gallons per second. Firefighters were spraying seawater onto the lava's edge using powerful pumps and fire hoses. At first, the flow was blocky, covered in volcanic bombs, and had a reddish, oxidized color. But with every passing minute, the lava kept changing under the influence of water. Soon, it became rougher, so much so that moving across it was already difficult. The surface of the flow turned from black to gray. As for the water, almost all of it turned into steam. Then, when people were sure that everything went as they expected, the water flow rate and volume started to increase. What came next was the boldest volcano watering ever attempted. They were spraying as much as 106 gallons per second onto the lava flow. The whole thing went on for about five months. First, I'll make a cup of coffee, then we'll continue. An unobtrusive reminder to do that thing under the video, just in case you forget. It all started with an eruption, and not just any eruption, one that caught everyone off guard. Around 8 p.m. on January 21st, 1973, a series of small tremors shook the area near Haimei Island. They were too weak for the locals to notice. Then a seismic station 37 miles away from Haimei recorded over 100 major tremors between 1 and 3 a.m. on January 22nd. These tremors kept going for a few more days, with the strongest one hitting 2.7 on the Richter scale. But no one was worried, as small quakes are common along tectonic plate boundaries. They rarely signal anything truly big. And that's why what happened next took everyone completely by surprise. Around 1.55 a.m. on January 23rd, over on the east side of the island, about 0.6 miles from downtown Vestmanair, a fissure suddenly appeared. It quickly spread from 980 feet to 6,500 feet. The fissure was just 650 feet from the eastern edge of the city, way too close for comfort. But that was only part of the problem because fountains of lava started shooting up from the fissure. There were about 40 of them along the entire fissure, spewing lava up to heights of 164 to 490 feet. The lava and tephra were erupting at a rate of 3,500 cubic feet per second. It looked downright apocalyptic. Soon, though, the activity focused on a single crater just beyond the eastern edge of the city. There, in just two days, lava fountains built up a cinder cone over 330 feet tall. But the lava kept spewing, and soon its flows spilled out from the cone, moving north and east, forming a continuously expanding lava delta. By early May, the lava flow stood between 30 and 69 feet high. On average, it was more than 121 feet thick, and in some places it reached 330 feet. To get a sense of the scale of the eruption, it's probably worth taking a look at Haimei itself. It's located 4.6 miles off the southern coast of Iceland and has an area of just 5 square miles. This is the largest island in the Vastmanair archipelago, with a population of about 5,000 people at the time of the eruption. Here's what the town looked like before it all began. Before the eruption in 1973, the Eldfell volcano on the island was considered dormant and there had been no recorded activity for 5,900 years. It's no wonder people didn't even suspect it could wake up. But when it all started, people had to be evacuated in a hurry. A light wind picked up, blowing from the west, which is pretty unusual for this time of year, and it carried the hot ash from the fissure away from the city. Luckily, this didn't happen right away, so people had time to escape. The island's police and fire brigade raised the alarm, and the residents rushed to the harbor. Due to the recent storm, all the fishing boats were there, which made it possible to evacuate people from the island in just a few hours. This was absolutely crucial, since the eruption was so close to the town that you could see it from the windows. The evacuation was carried out in the first few hours, and just in time, the lava streams were already slowly making their way to the eastern part of the city, and the whole small island faced the threat of ashfall. Luckily, the lava flows and falling tephra didn't hit the island's runway at first, and a few people who couldn't leave the island by sea were evacuated by air. In the end, within six hours of the eruption starting, almost all of the 5,300 islanders safely made it to Iceland. And although the volcano erupted right near the city, the disaster only resulted in one death. This is surprising in its own way since there was serious damage. 
The houses, located close to the fault, were soon destroyed by the lava flows and falling tephra, and as I mentioned, the wind changed, leading to widespread tephra falls across the rest of the island. Many houses were destroyed by the weight of the fallen ash, but volunteer crews working to clear the roofs of ash and boarding up windows managed to save some of them. Apart from the houses, by the end of January, tephra had covered most of the island, with some areas having a layer up to 16 feet thick. In addition to collapsing under the weight, some houses also burned down from lava bombs or were just crushed by the advancing lava flows. Just like this concrete water reservoir, the lava just crushed it. And although the heavy tephra fall stopped somewhere around the beginning of February, it was the lava flows that started causing real damage. By early May, about 300 buildings had either been swallowed by these flows or destroyed by fire. Another 60 to 70 houses were buried under tephra. The lava wave also destroyed one fish processing plant and damaged two others, and it also wrecked the city's power plant. Oh, and one more thing. The eruption was happening underwater, too, where to the north of the fissure, an electrical cable was torn and the water supply was disrupted. Surprisingly, people tried to fight the volcano. A team of about 250 volunteers stayed on the island to save the houses, as I said, they were clearing tephra off the roofs and removing belongings from homes in the path of the lava. All the windows facing the volcano were covered with corrugated iron back in early February. This was necessary to prevent hop bombs from getting in and starting fires. The rescue efforts in the city were initially focused on saving the abandoned houses from the ash and fire. However, it soon became clear that the main danger came from the flowing lava. This lava threatened not only the city, but also the harbor. The concerns here became really serious. If the harbor got blocked by lava, the island's fishing industry would be wiped out. And Haymae contributed about 3% to Iceland's GDP, so its impact on the whole country's economy would be huge. Yes, the destruction of homes and infrastructure was painful and costly, but the biggest threat was the likelihood of lava flows blocking the harbor. If that happened, it would make no sense to return to the island. In general, this was something that shouldn't have been allowed to happen. So the lava needed to be slowed down, and people decided to cool it down. In fact, this isn't the first time something like this has been attempted. Lava flows were sprayed with water in an effort to slow them down in Hawaii and on Mount Etna, but those were pretty small-scale operations with limited success. Iceland, however, was planning to do something no one had ever done before. At least in terms of the scale of operation. An extensive network of pipes and pumps was set up to spray seawater onto the lava to slow its advance and even redirect its flow. About 6.2 million tons of seawater were used, and in the end, it really saved the harbor. But let's go step by step. So people already knew that the lava flow could be stopped by cooling it with seawater. The cooled lava hardens and becomes solid, creating a barrier for the lava upstream. This stops the flow and preserves the harbor, while also preventing further damage to the city's structures. In one go, up to 129,000 square feet of lava flow could be cooled, with internal barriers forming within the flow, thickening, and piling up on themselves. And yes, water turned out to be the most practical way to cool the lava. It absorbs heat from the lava, and as it heats up to boiling point, it simply turns into steam. This was important for the most efficient cooling. One of the most notable things about the operation to cool the lava was the deposition of a large amount of salt there. I mean, the water evaporates, but since it's seawater, the salt stays on the surface of the lava. As a result, large areas of the flow were covered with a crust of vast white deposits, and it was estimated that a total of up to 220,000 tons of salt were deposited. But that's just an interesting fact. Let's get back to the cooling process itself, because it's literally a battle of man against the volcano. You don't come across that every day. The first attempt to cool down the lava with water was made 15 days after the eruption started, when the lava started getting close to the harbor entrance. At first, people began spraying seawater directly onto the leading edge of the creeping lava, and it seemed to have some effect. Inspired, the people brought more powerful pumps from the Big Island, and the spraying increased. However, even these pumps weren't powerful enough to reach the top of the lava's edge. It was impossible to bring the hoses closer because the lava's edge was steep, hot, and constantly moving. And then it was March 1st. The dredging boat Sandy arrived and began spraying seawater on the lava flow. Yes, straight from the sea. Sandy did its job and the lava surface cooled down, preventing a large chunk from continuing toward the harbor. But it was clear that more powerful pumps were needed to really stop the flow. 
The goal was to hold out until they arrived. Meanwhile, fire hoses were attached to the main water pipeline fitted with regular fire nozzles to spray water on the lava's edge. In the end, they created something like a solid wall that grew higher every time the molten lava tried to spill over the edge. Sometimes molten lava also oozed from the front, but it never spread too far before solidifying under the influence of the water. As a precaution, the movement of the lava front was tracked day and night, and this long and relentless struggle continued for over a month. While some people were spraying water on the lava, others were using bulldozers to build protective embankments in the path of the flow toward the city. By the end of March, a fifth of the city was covered by lava flows, and then, finally, the pumps arrived. 32 of them, each with a capacity of up to 264 gallons per second. They were brought in from the U.S. and put to work immediately. After these pumps started cooling the flow heading towards the city, its movement slowed down dramatically and soon came to a halt. However, the pump shafts kept breaking down from time to time, probably because they were designed for pumping oil, not water. But in Reykjavik, they quickly made new ones and shipped them to the island. As for the local equipment, fire trucks were used, one of the port vessels with its pumps, and the Sandy, which I've already mentioned. The Sandy had a large diameter hose nozzle that could direct a cascade of seawater straight onto the lava and cool it as much as seawater could. Unfortunately, most of the water returned to the sea without reaching the most critical spots, so people decided to lay a water pipeline in the lava field about 650 feet behind the edge of the lava. Of course, this decision required a very complicated operation. The pipes used for the pipeline were steel and they could only be moved with a bulldozer and it had to be done over still moving lava. However, the tephra that settled on the lava provided an insulating layer and it was possible to drive on it. This was probably the first time in history a bulldozer drove onto still flowing lava. The first experiment was quite successful as the bulldozer made its way to the lava front and managed to clear a 330-foot road through the lava field in just a few hours. But the driver had to be really careful. Scorching lava fragments immediately surfaced, but the lava showed no signs of sinking under the bulldozer even though it was molten. Luckily, falling into a lava river? Well, that's hardly what you'd call fun. Just ask Anakin Skywalker. And then the lava edge grew so high that the bulldozer couldn't climb it anymore and people had to do the work by hand. A different, more suitable spot was chosen for building the road, allowing the pipe to be transported by trucks over the lava flow. The workers managed to bolt the pipe sections together from a pumping ship anchored in the bay between the breakwater and the scans area, but it was extremely difficult. Once pumping started, the pipes kept breaking due to the shifting lava. The steam also made it harder to work, blocking visibility. Still, more and more pipe sections were put in place until the line stretched about 650 feet over the lava, making cooling possible. On this topographic map, the main pipelines that supplied cooling water are marked in blue. As you can see, they extended far into the lava flow. And laying pipes over an active lava flow was a seriously risky job. The heat was intense, the fumes were thick, and you couldn't see a thing. Plus, the bulldozer tracks and the tephra quickly turned into rough, shifting terrain because, well, the lava was on the move. But even with all these dangers, the workers still managed to push the pipes up to 420 feet inward from the flow front. A few people got some minor burns, but no major injuries, which is pretty amazing in itself. Turns out, plastic pipes can actually be used to spread water over lava, Sometimes empty pipes would melt or even burn if they touched hot lava, but if they were filled with water, they could handle the heat surprisingly well. Bulldozers would gather the plastic pipes into sections between 330 and 650 feet long and drag them onto the lava. That way, they were much easier to install than metal ones, plus they didn't break when the lava shifted and moved. After pumping water for 15 days using nearly 132 million gallons of seawater, a solid barrier formed across the lava flow, but that was just the beginning. The cooling operation was completed only on July 10, 1973. By that time, about 1.9 billion gallons of seawater had been pumped out. In early July, the eruption finally stopped and fresh lava no longer reached the surface. In the end, the volume of lava and tephra thrown out by the volcano over five months was estimated at around 8.8 .8 billion cubic feet. But not all of that caused destruction. About one square mile of new land was added to the island, increasing its area by roughly 
In the end, the harbor entrance got much narrower but wasn't closed off and what used to be a lava flow started working as a breakwater. This actually did the harbor good and made it better protected from storms. When it comes to the population, by the end of 1975, about 85% had returned to the island. Even earlier, by 1974, fishing companies were already back to their previous production levels. Sure, they had to deal with the aftermath, fixing or rebuilding the houses, clearing the streets and the harbor, but if the lava flow couldn't be stopped, there'd be nowhere for people to go back to, and no reason for them to come back. It should be said that the island was kind of lucky because the lava control method was a perfect fit for the local conditions. First, the initial eruption happened just 0.6 miles from the city center and harbor. Second, the flow was slow enough for people to come up with a plan and start controlling the lava. Third, seawater was easily accessible. No need to transport it, they just had to lay the pipes. And fourth, these pipes as well as the pumping equipment were easy to move since it's Iceland, both sea and land transport are well established here. The whole operation cost $1,447,742. It was a serious amount for those times, but if people hadn't done anything, the lava would have probably flowed slowly for another month on top of what it actually did. Not to mention that the flow would have destroyed the city and taken away the harbor, and with it, the livelihoods of the people. But actually, the island was lucky in that the eruption, no matter how terrifying it looked in photos, wasn't all that big. Well, by Icelandic standards, the total amount of erupted material was about 8.8 .8 billion cubic feet, most of which was lava. For example, the eruption of Surtsey sent out four times more magma and created an entire island. But even though it was modest by Icelandic standards, the eruption and the fight with the lava made headlines across the world. Everything that happened on the island was constantly covered by Icelandic news groups, and in Europe, the eruption was one of the most talked about stories. It went head to head with news about peace talks for the Vietnam War to give you an idea of how big it was. The islanders' efforts to cool the lava flows also grabbed special attention, featured in magazines like National Geographic. And afterwards, when the eruption was over, that attention led to a boom in tourism. Everyone wanted to see the results in person. And I understand those people. I'd love to see it too. On top of that, against all logic, the new lava field actually improved the harbor and overall life on the island. Also, against all logic, the forced relocation of people had a positive effect too. And not because people, well, you know, didn't die. It's just that their evacuation positively affected both earnings and education for those under 25 at the time of the eruption. But what really amazed me was the fact that after the eruption, the island's residents used the heat from the cooling lava flows to get hot water and generate electricity. No, really. The thing is, the insides of lava flows can maintain temperatures of several hundred degrees for many years due to the very low thermal conductivity of the rocks. After the eruption ended, scientists started looking into the possibility of extracting geothermal heat from the gradually cooling flows and they found that it was possible. Soon experimental heating systems were developed and by 1974, the first house was connected. In the end, the lava provided the island's residents with cheap heating and hot water for many years after the eruption. As for the tephra, they even managed to use it, but this time to extend the local airport's runways and as material for the landfill. New houses were later built on this landfill. And as for the Eldfell volcano, it's still classified as active, but there doesn't seem to be any sign of an impending eruption. You owe me a like. See you later.